This is my first Zoom meeting, so I don't know where to look, but I'll look at you guys. Oh, hi. <laughs> Didn't know it was that close. So uh, a few cases, and then we'll talk about some other things. For those who are not from Pittsburgh, welcome to Pittsburgh, either in person or virtually. I apologize for the weather outside. It's never cloudy here. This is the one day of the year it's cloudy. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to be here that day. So why anesthesiologists and neurologists need each other? We, we work sort of in the same place. And we need you a lot of times when things go wrong in, in some of these places. Um, I apologize. This should say an epidural needle for what we're going to talk about. We like to stop right, right here, just where the stop sign says stop. But sometimes we go a little <clears throat> further, and this is, this is the result. We're going to talk about that space beneath the dura mater in a few minutes. This is why neurologists and anesthesiologists need each other and why this conference is so important. When an epidural catheter goes in, it gets tested with three cc's of lidocaine with epinephrine. We're trying to figure out if we have a subarachnoid catheter placement or an intravenous catheter placement. That's huge in our world as anesthesiologists. That's enormous, and we take great pains to draw back, looking for fluid, and to let gravity tell us if we're in a blood vessel. Wherever you are in the world, or you are in the world as neurologists, who interact with your anesthesia colleagues, you may see different combinations of drugs, narcotics, local anesthesia used for labor. Here at this hospital, at the University of Pittsburgh, we use ropivacaine, and we call it the crazy eights, eight cc's, an hour of infusion, eight cc bolus, and a lockout of eight minutes. So as a neurologist out there in the world, you should maybe get familiar with what your labor and delivery suite does because these folks, are, these folks, meaning we folks, anesthesiologists, will be calling you. Here are some things we, we make happen. We make hypotension happen. We make total spinal anesthesia happen. Perhaps we cause seizures. Perhaps we cause a frank wet tap. We put a big needle in the back so people can have back aches. We can cause epidural hematomas. We can cause epidural abscesses. We take great pains to know what the blood pressure is, and we instruct nurses to do a couple things twice before we say, wow, we really bottomed out this patient's blood pressure. So we have, we have rules about when to call for low blood pressure to make sure we're not inadvertently being called or erroneously being called. So this happened, uh, when did this happen, John? La uh, last month. Every anesthesiologist and obstetrician who took care of this patient, I just left on the third floor of this building. And they're very interested that they were going to present this case because we've been talking about it all week. So they all say hello. 43-year-old G6P2, gestational hypertension, tricuspid regurge, wants analgesia for a cephalic version. The obstetrician has to flip this baby. Not a big deal. Put in an epidural, relax everything, flip the baby. Very, very boring medical history. No meds, nothing, nothing. Epidural gets placed without difficulty. The test dose is negative. So we don't think it's in the CSF, in the subarachnoid space. We don't think it's in a blood vessel. The version happens successfully in the operating room around 5 o'clock, 1700. She goes back to the labor room and is now severely hypotensive, requiring a phenylephrine infusion. I came on at 7, and in the sign out to me, I was told, you have an anesthesia resident who must remain in this labor room because you can't be in a labor room with a vasoactive substance running without an anesthesia provider being in there. So I'm already down one person on my team, and the anesthesiologist who turned this over to me said, 
let's let this thing wear off, let the epidural wear off, let's, let, let's see what happens. Give it six hours or so, so that's going to be three in the morning. And at three in the morning, we're going to fire this epidural back up because the lady's in a little bit of labor pain. Not rip-roaring labor pain, not screaming labor pain, but she's feeling things. So we're going to start this epidural back up. Same epidural. Now, during the six hours in between, the dressing had come a little dislodged. So the residents went in and redressed the thing. It had moved out. It had moved a little bit. So we pulled it back out a little bit. Repeated aspiration, nothing. It's not intravascular. It's not intrathecal. Test dose of lidocaine goes in. Always give a test dose. Again, negative. Further and further and further proof that it's not intravascular, it's not intrathecal. And we started to dose it slowly with our routine University of Pittsburgh cocktail. Four cc's of 0.1% ropivacaine. And 10 minutes later, this lady's eyes rolled back in her head. She gave a little scream and out like a light. Hypotensive, out. So we, and apneic, so we had a bag a little bit. Um, maybe it's subarachnoid. Maybe it really is in the subarachnoid space and we're just not pulling back fluid. She has no motor blockade at this point. Second epidural goes in. Perfect epidural. Perfect, perfect. Loss of resistance, easy passing. Everything is perfect. Testos, negative. Ten minutes later, eyes roll back in the head, phew, out, like a light, again. Um, no motor blockade here either, making, you know, intrathecal or high spinal, unlikely. The woman said, basically, I, I don't know what you people are doing, but I'm going to pass on this for a while. Uh, there used to be an expression when somebody died under anesthesia, and the expression was, they didn't take well to the anesthesia. This lady basically said to us, I'm not taking well to the anesthesia. And every time I went in there, she just basically did, I don't know who you people are, but stay away from me. I had two babies over at West Penn, two perfectly, perfectly working epidurals. I, I don't know what you're all doing here at, at Pitt, but it's, it's certainly different. Um, and, and we said, oh, well, maybe uh, when the sun comes up and if you're not in rip-roaring labor pain, some nitrous. So the next day takes place, and she gets nitrous for about five hours. She got stayed all for a little while. She got a little fentanyl PCA for a while. She had a nice concoction until later that afternoon, early evening, uh, one of the anesthesiologists who's right upstairs right now and the obstetrician convinced her, let's have a C-section because something really crazy is going on here. And she finally said, yes, that seems like a great idea. So the catheter came out, and on purpose now, on purpose, a needle went into the CSF on purpose and the usual spinal dose, and she had a perfectly fine C-section, nothing Nothing was, was wrong. Mother and baby did fine. Um, why, did this lady, why did this lady faint? Why did she pass out three times, twice in front of my very eyes? Um, and usually when it comes to stuff like this, my mind goes blank, which is why I call a neurologist. And, and look, you're, all, you're here. How perfect is this? Um, neurologists love diagnoses for syncope. I'm sure you could discuss it till the cows come home. Uh, cardiogenic stuff, vasovagal high spinal, intravascular, epidural, all these things we, we said a million times were unlikely. Um, as anesthesiologists, uh, let's call neurology. I hear they're having a meeting right here soon. Here it is. Um, so the only thing we can come up with now is uh, something called a, a subdural catheter, which you couldn't, which you couldn't find unless you're an interventional radiologist squirting dye. And on a lot of these catheters that behave weird, a subdural catheter, patchy block, uh, 
Horner syndrome, the four I saw at the Brigham uh, over 20 years, every single subdural catheter started with an OB nurse saying, get Andy in here, this lady's face is wrong. I said, what are you talking about? He said, look at her face, that's not her face. And it wasn't, it was four Horner syndromes, and the minute we see that, or at least the minute I see that, I, I just go with subdural catheter. Um, that's just the way it is. Because even with people who've been gone, who have gone to radiology suites and have had dye squirted in for these interventional radiologists to prove, oh look, subdural catheter, that's awesome. The answer is we're never going to use it for labor analgesia because of how inconsistent it is. I mean, you can have medication go in the subdural space, which is severely compressed, and instead of gravity bringing it to the floor, it shoots it right up to the ventricles in the brain, and it hits the lights out button, and there have been case reports of complete apnea, loss of consciousness, profound hypotension. I, I haven't found one about death yet, thank, thank goodness. Um, so that case... You could, you could quickly come to the conclusion about a subdural catheter. And I know the folks back in Boston are listening in now, and I, I hope they still do. If somebody has a Horner syndrome on a labor and delivery street, uh, labor and delivery unit, yank that catheter. Don't use it for labor analgesia. So, and of course, why would we call neurologists because of all these other reasons for syncope? Um, so we thought that was an interesting one. Uh, this lady had um, mono dye twins complicated by twin anemia, polycythemia sequence, and was having percutaneous umbilical blood sampling in the operating room under sedation, just sedation, no medical history, perfectly healthy young woman. The procedure goes swimmingly. It's, it's perfect. The procedure's over. I'm in one operating room doing a stat general anesthetic for a, a, a bad baby, a bad tracing, and somebody calls on the phone and says, can you come to the pub's patient she's seizing? And I said, no, nah, that surgery, that's over. I think you're getting on the stretcher. Well, she's seizing. And went in, and she was tachycardic unresponsive to painful stimulus, rhythmic head bobbing movement, and then I, of course I have to ask the neurologist about that, rhythmic head bobbing, is that a seizure? No generalized tonic-clonic activity, pupils dilated, foaming at the mouth. This is a horrible situation. You got but midazolam times two, no change in mental status. We called a condition C, which those of you are out there in the country, that's just a... Um, rapid response, which also brings a critical care doctor. That's kind of a, a, of a pit thing. It's critical, rapid response plus a critical care doctor is a condition C. We bring the ICU to the patient to prevent the patient needing to come to the ICU. That's basically a, a, a pit thing from Mike DeVita from a million years ago, if anybody's old enough to remember Mike. We intubated her for airway protection because we knew she was going to go on a road trip She's going to a scanner somewhere, and uh, put an A-line in. The tube went in just fine. Head CT is fine. Nothing strange. Um, we also gave her uh, magnesium because we figure any seizure after 20 weeks is an eclamptic seizure until proven otherwise, and I know you disagree with the, the, the magnesium, or John told me so, but so you have to teach me that. Um, but don't forget, when you call a condition C, you're getting the cavalry. So I, I now have two operating rooms. Each must have 20 people, the general anesthetic in one room and the seizing lady in the other. So a big portion of the labor and delivery resources were in my two rooms at the same time. Now, she goes up to the ICU. EEG is fine. Nothing. Then she starts the head bobbing while the EEG is running. There's no EEG correlate with the head bobbing, nothing. No seizure, no epileptiform activity, no personal or family history of seizures, preeclampsia, trauma, stroke, meningitis, nothing. This woman seized out of, out of the blue. Not hypertensive during the case. 
not, not whatsoever. Now it's five in the morning, day two, and to my little bit of dismay, the critical care folks haven't really called you. I haven't called for neurology because I figured, well, where's Dan? Let's go, let's go. Where, where's neurology? And, and, and I kept reading the thing and calling in from home. So what does the neurologist think? Eh, we haven't really called the neurologist yet. What are you crazy? So by the time the neurologist got there, this woman had come around, successfully extubated with a normal neuro exam. I, I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to explain that. Um, okay. I left out one little thing. At, at the, the, the next morning, let me re rephrase this. The next morning, the babies looked bad. So intubated. She was taken from the fourth floor to the second floor and had an emergency section under anesthesia on levofed for her blood pressure, which was tanking because of the sedation to get rid of the head bobbing. So by the time, that, again, by the time the neurologist got there the next afternoon, extubated, walking around, she said, oh, my stomach hurts a little bit. Uh, babies are fine. She's fine. And I have no reason for the season in this woman who was otherwise normal. And the reason I ask about the head bobbing is because I asked a neurology friend last night. He said, head bobbing like this, that's not a seizure. <laughs> right? Wait, wait, is he correct or incorrect? Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. No, it's not. Nor is not a seizure. That's what he said. Oh, good. I'm glad How awesome. <laughs> this is why anesthesiologists and neurologists have to hang out. That's awesome. He said, this is not. Oh, that's a no, no, no. That's how you remember. No, no. No, 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 it's not a seizure. He said, this is a seizure. This isn't a seizure. I'm telling you, no, I'm not having a seizure. Right. They, they said, Dash, if you used to take people out of the beds at the VA and stand them up and said, if you're really seizing, I want to see you fall down. Otherwise, it's a pseudo seizure and you're faking it. I don't think he ever let anybody fall on the ground, but, uh, but he had some dramatic ways of uh, going about that. Well, I hope you find those four cases interesting. Um, this this uh, meeting is uh, awesome because we um, make great use of neurologists both back in Boston and, and, and here in Pittsburgh. You want to chat about... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. No, who would have questions? 